Hi, and welcome to Conversations with Elizabeth Johnston. I'm your host, Elizabeth, and I am very excited to have a guest with us today named Patrick Weaver. Patrick is a kingdom builder, entrepreneur, author, and business strategist. Through his inspirational blogs, social media, and online presence, Patrick has the privilege of reaching and impacting over 1 million people from around the world every month for the cause of Christ. Patrick is an outspoken advocate and leading voice of change for victims of domestic abuse. You can find Patrick's content and blog at patrickweaver.org. Patrick, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Cannot wait for this discussion. I can't either. I am so glad to be here. Thank you so much. Listen, uh, Patrick, you have an amazing story. It's actually a a very tragic um, uh, beginning to your story. And I would love for our listeners uh, to just hear the, the personal part of your story that fuels your compassion for victims of abuse in the church. Absolutely. My mother was my hero but she was also a victim of uh, horrific abuse by my father, who was uh, an alcoholic, uh, a rageaholic, I should say. Mm -hmm. Um, And she endured as a uh, part of that generation that uh, believes and believed that uh, until death do us part, regardless of what that might come with. Uh, And in her particular case, um, highly educated, um, very dedicated, but uh, she was unable to free herself from that abuse. And wow. she resolved herself to spend her life uh, mm. as an abuse victim. Uh, and I had front row seat to mm. that horrendous daily barrage of abuse. Mm. Uh, and as I said before, my mother is my my hero. She is is someone who despite it all she never spoke a bad word about my father and uh she would always always um encourage and never put down so after he died my mother chose to remain silent not speak out about uh, abuse at all and i publicly honored that and not Mm -hmm. Spoke and, and so I didn't speak about it, at least publicly, where she would actually encounter it. Mm-hmm. And she died three years ago, at which time, uh, no holes barred. No holes wow. barred. Wow. I mean, you have a very high traffic uh, blog and social media presence. Are you saying that's happened just in the last three years? The opening up about abuse is more so over the last three years. Um, okay the social media presence and primarily focused on encouragement and really speaking truth to lies. That's probably Mm. one of my biggest um, advocacies in addition to uh, abuse victims is just speaking truth to lies, biblical truth to to, to lies. Uh, And in the last three years though, more so focused on encouraging uh, abuse victims. And so there's been a lot of activity uh, certainly surrounding that as it's been something as most will know, I, I don't mince my words. Right. <laughs> Yo, you're very articulate. I often read your posts on Facebook and Instagram and think, wow, he worded that so perfectly. I, I wish I could have thought to word it that way. Um, and I, I frequently share your content as well. Um, now, did anyone in the church know about your mother's abuse? I'm curious. Oh, absolutely. He would show up actually at the church while we were actually attending church and be standing outside of the church raging. And the men of God, so-called men of God, did nothing for your mother to protect her? Not a single time. My mother never received a visit, never received any support from church whatsoever. And had your father been the one that was being abused, what do you think would have happened? Immediate parachuting down of elders and church Mm -hmm. to to blame my mother for somehow 
triggering or causing his <laughs> behavior, right? I, I'm sure church discipline would have been enacted against this Jezebel of a woman, right? <laughs> immediately, <laughs> immediately. That's the, uh, that's the patriarchal, uh, you know, habit. Uh, of double standard. Double standard, double standard. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's tragic and it's no different today. It's no different today. My mother, my mother's experience is really the experience of many and most today uh, in the church. Sadly, sadly. Could you contrast for us that double standard, that patriarchal, pharisaical double standard with the heart of Jesus? Oh, my goodness. That's what I think we're waiting for all mm -hmm. understand and know the heart of Jesus. Where is Jesus in the messaging, in the advocacy for victims? Mm. Uh, Jesus came for the lost, the hurting. Uh, mm. We're called to the lost and, and, and the hurting, to defend the oppressed. Uh, but that conflicts with toxic patriarchy. Mm. And as a result, though we know better, we refuse to do better. Uh, and that's a sad and tragic uh, issue plaguing many, many, many churches. I would say the majority. And that's where people like us come in. We are trying to be a voice and use whatever voice and platform the Lord has given us to shed light on this issue um, and to really equip churches to be better prepared to deal with things that are, we, we freely admit, Patrick, that these are not easy issues to navigate. You know, they, they can be somewhat challenging. They can be confusing because people are, you know, um, sly and they are manipulative and they are deceptive. And so it can be hard sometimes to get to the bottom of it. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we should be able to navigate this in a way that honors God, that um, that honors the heart of, of Jesus, and that uh, advocates for uh, the oppressed inside the church, right? Right. You would think it would be, and it should be, a no-brainer. This is <laughs> an obvious uh, opportunity, really, if you think about it. One in three mm -hmm. women are victims of abuse one in three one in three women sitting in the church is experiencing some form of abuse mm -hmm. now uh, P patrick when you when you say abuse are you only referring to physical abuse no 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 and that i think is what also you know sometimes gets uh confused when yeah. i say abuse and I and, and the abuse that I'm referring to is any form of physical emotional or spiritual abuse mm -hmm. that is occurring in the church uh, at least one in three women are experiencing that and if you think of the church as a refuge this is an opportunity for the church to recognize that its mission field is community not only the individuals in the pew but with abuse being an epidemic, mm. this is a discipleship opportunity mm. uh, for community uh, and as well opportunity to create ministry, uh, in reach ministry is what I refer to it as, in reach ministry that specifically addresses and deals with abuse victims and managing or helping them to navigate uh this this uh monstrous behavior that they're enduring mostly in silence mm. so patrick two and a half three years ago i did not think this problem existed inside the church uh i was i was ignorant of it um, or maybe I was purposefully closing my eyes to it. I was too busy fighting the leftist feminist agenda, uh, which takes the um, message of female empowerment to a sinful extreme. And I did not think this problem existed. So why don't we do this? Why don't you tell a story and I tell a story that we know of uh, in which we have witnessed spiritual abuse, what, whether it was physical or not, 
inside the church, you know, explain how the church handled it or mishandled it. Um, so that the listener can understand what is it that we're talking about? Because there are plenty of people listening who don't really think this is an issue. Oh, absolutely. And can, can you give me an example, a specific example? Absolutely. Many. Okay. You know, and I'll use the one that I, I refer to a lot and I wrote about actually, um, and because it's typical to one degree or another. Okay. Um, a victim of abuse was shouldering it in silence, mm -hmm. sitting in the pew. She brought this to the attention of the church and which probably took her a very long time and was extremely frightening. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, her, she was told to pray mm -hmm. and to be more submissive. Yeah. Learn, learn to be more submissive so that she could overcome him and his proclivity to phys uh, verbally and spiritually abuse her. That's where it was when it started. Mm -hmm. That escalated. It became physical. When she came back to the church to let them know, church leaders, that this individual who was also uh, in the church in a leadership role, they told her to um, love him more. Just love on him, love him more. As the physical violence continued to escalate and she applied the love on him more theory, uh, it didn't work. And she came back to church. They reiterated love conquers all. <laughs> and in the last beating that he gave her <sighs> that put her in the hospital, she continued to yell as he was beating her and kicking her in the ribs. I love you more. And, and that was continued until he got tired. And after he got tired of kicking her, he asked her, do you still love me? <laughs> this is the kind of messaging, the toxic, mm -hmm dangerous messaging that is pervasive in the church today. And her church sent her back into that situation to continue to be abused. Most, I would say 80% are sent back into the fiery furnace. So all out of all these women and the victims that you're assisting, you would say that 80% of women are sent back, that there is not a boundary of nope protection is going to be our first priority for the the wife and her children and and then we'll see if down the road you know restoration is possible that's not no. the method that you tend to see right absolutely not i don't think that it is as intentional as it is ingrained it's the grid with which they see everything that they don't even realize we don't you know we don't see women as um, equal. So when you say toxic patriarchy, you're not saying that um, the Bible doesn't teach us loving leadership is appropriate, right? No. In fact, if we were following the loving leadership of the Bible, this would not be occurring or leadership would not be uh, the, the um, perpetrators of this kind of behavior. Right. So let me give you my, my example. Um, I believe that this woman was actually in a seventh day Adventist denomination and her, um, it was very culty. It was, it was like, it was almost like an offshoot, I think of the seventh day Adventist and she and her children, I believe it was five children basically lived in a shed and no running water. And she was expected to, you know, have her babies in the shed, all natural, was not properly fed, would eat dandelions. And when the pastor found out about the situation, he came in even at one point to see what their living conditions were. And 
the woman was told to submit more. She was told that she was under the judgment of God and that I'm not exaggerating. This is a real story. This woman has become a friend of mine. Um, and she's actually written a book about, about, uh, her story. And she was told that she needed to submit more and that the judgment of God would, would lift (laughs) (laughs) off of her life. And, you know, she finally somehow, and, and so many of these women are, you know, stay at home moms. They have no income. They have no financial resources to uh, get out of the abusive situation. Um, she somehow broke free and has spent, I think, upwards of six years then being re-traumatized and re-abused through the family court system. Oh, absolutely. As, as her husband um, or ex-husband now you know, tries to take the children from her and fights for custody of the children. There is a whole nother world out there that so many people in the body of Christ are completely ignorant is taking place in the life of so many people inside the four walls of the church that you're attending every week. Yeah. And, uh, and we can do so much better as God's people to um, speak up for the weak and the powerless and the defenseless and the oppressed. And that is why, you know, I'm so passionate about this uh, and why I wanted to, to have you on to share about this, Patrick. Absolutely. Why do women stay with their abusers? You know, I think a lot of it has to do, not a lot, uh, and my mother included, as you said, there are so many other issues that are are not discussed with regards to the abusive environment. Mm-hmm. Many victims are dealing with the trauma, freeze, fright, fear. Mm-hmm. They are economically not in a position to where they can just walk out the door. Right. These are stay-at-home moms. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of victims are are not equipped with the resources that are necessary in order to just start over again. Right. And so that is a very complicated issue. And then, and then there are the terrorizing threats from the abuser that I'm going to take the children away from you and all of those things. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And as you as you indicated, family court is the second round of abuse. And that by itself, Mm. I think, is frightening enough. It's enough to put you in your grave. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Anticipating the kinds of atrocities that occur within the family courts, the reluctance on the part of many courts to even issue protective orders Mm. uh, and the use or misuse of the fraudulent tactic, uh, parental alienation by the uh, uh, abuser, um, really turns the court, the family court, into, or rather, it weaponizes the family court. Uh, The abuser weaponizes the family court, manipulates the family court. And I think a lot of victims have to choose, unfortunately, Mm. between um, these anticipated um, risks and threats. Yeah external and living with the abuser. A lot of us think the choice is just simply whether to leave or go or leave or stay. That's not the choice. The choice is whether to accept this abuse or Mm. subject themselves to the, the, the oncoming or incoming abuses uh, uh, that follow the aftermath court, this, this terrorized (laughs) individual who, you know, isn't going to stop abusing a many, in many instances. Who, who has more money than you to fight you? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, when you're in court, you're fighting, against, you're fighting against not only abuse, you're fighting against an economic advantage, you're fighting against a deaf and blind judge mm-hmm. in many instances. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a daunting task. It's a daunting task. And to add insult to injury, then you have oftentimes 
the secondary abuse of, of uh, spiritual abuse inside the church when the church will not support you, not understand um, the position that you've been placed in, and when they believe the smooth-talking elder, <laughs> let's say, who's actually you know, abusing his wife. They believe, they believe the smooth talking guy who can quote plenty of scripture, um, but is living a different life behind closed doors. Which, which oftentimes leaves the victim with, uh, you know, as you said, results in spiritual abuse, but the world as they knew it (laughs) ceases to exist when they walk away. The church typically turns against the victim. Incredible. Is biblical submission, Patrick, is that permission to abuse? Can you talk about that for a second? (laughs) That is probably, Elizabeth, one of the most grotesque uh, distortions Mm -hmm. used on victims to spiritually abuse uh, victims of of domestic violence biblical submission ephesians actually is taken out of context ephesians 21 starts with if there's a a b and c part to ephesians 5 21 through 33 ephesians 5 21 starts with husbands and wives submit to one another out of reverence for christ Mm -hmm and profound respect for Christ. The balance of Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 is now then an explanation of what that submission looks like for both the husband and the wife. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 25 through 33 is spent entirely on the husband. Mm-hmm. And what his submission looks like, that is the part that is unfortunately left out of most of the conversations with regards to submission, mm-hmm. leaving to believe that the Bible actually refers to submission only as it pertains to the wife. That's the big lie. Mm-hmm. That is the big lie. It is right. a submission out of reverence for Christ, for the institution but the institution is not above God. Yeah. Patrick, if you could go back to your childhood as you experienced the horrific trauma of watching your mom be abused, and if you could have the men in the church uh, that handled the situation correctly, what would you have had them do? At the time, and I can certainly say from a child's perspective, at that time, I, I continuously thought naively that uh, at any moment, men from the church would knock on the door and say, hey, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable it's visible in the community. You're not just abusive at home, but we see the behavior in community, right? We see it in front of the church. I had an incident where one night my father was drunk and he was raging at my mother and it felt to me as if it were physical. It was verbal, but it felt physical. Mm -hmm. It was violent. And in my own mind, I thought that he was going to harm my mother physically Mm -hmm. and i didn't know what else to do but creep out of the living room into our laundry room and i picked up a mop that at that time mops had a metal handle at the bottom to Mm -hmm. clamp the mop and i walked back into the living room as he was still raging and not paying attention and I just blurted out, if you hit my mother, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And he responded with just insanity. But nevertheless, he lunged at my mother at that point. And when he did, I swung the mop handle 
as hard as I could with every desire for it to, in fact, kill him, because that was the only way in my mind to stop him. And it missed him. And my mother said, he's not worth it. He's not worth it. She was crying and asking me to put the mop down. He's not worth it. And I said to her, well, who is going to stop him? Mm. And my mother said, somebody will. And I said at that time, and I still feel to this day, that somebody should have been men from the church. Yeah, 100%. And that's what she was waiting on. And that never arrived for her. It never arrived. Never mm-hmm. arrived. Mm-hmm. We can and must do better as God's people. This is a major problem in the church today. You uh, uh, trying to say that it does not exist does not make that true. And, um, And we need the men of God more than anyone to be making sure that the women in your church are safe, defending the oppressed, teaching on this from the pulpit, how, how husbands, um, should love and, and respect their wives. And certainly in private moments and counseling moments, be making sure that uh, victims are safe. That should be the first priority above all else. We are idolizing the institution of marriage above the people inside of the marriage. And that is idolatry, just as any other form, as much of, as any other form of idolatry. Absolutely. And um, I just want to thank you, Patrick, for everything you're doing on this topic. I know it comes from um, just so much personal tragedy of your own, and it has not been an easy um, process for you to work through as well. But we want the listener to make sure they connect with you. It's patrickweaver.org, right? Yes, yes, yes. And Patrick Weaver Ministries uh, for social media. Okay, Patrick Weaver Ministries on the plat- the social media platforms. Excellent, excellent content. Very shareable, very informative and inspiring. So many people in your life that are in the fog of abuse could... L- be set free just from Patrick's content. So I want to uh, highly recommend that you follow Patrick and share his content and connect with him and his blog at patrickweaver.org. Make sure you share this podcast and subscribe to Conversations with Elizabeth Johnston. Patrick, God bless you for everything you are doing to advocate for the oppressed inside the church and uh, for loving Jesus well and carrying his heart. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to have you today. Thank you so much for having me. God bless.